<laughs> hey there, and welcome to Large Format Friday. I'm your host, Matt Marash, and if this is the first time you're stopping by the channel, here's a playlist of our entire second season of LFF. And if you haven't subscribed yet, each and every Friday, we're going to be here, and we're going to be talking about something large format. Today, there's no camera behind me. There's just an empty background. What gives? Well, if I turn the camera around, you're going to see. We are doing some wild stuff today, and it involves a whole lot of light because we are playing around once again with the RA4 color reversal process. This process is not for the faint of heart. It's something I've been shipping away on and off for almost a year now. Now, that's not like a year start to finish. I'm thinking about it every single day, but like, you know, it's one of those projects that you play with it, you put it down, you try it again, but it is a time consuming process because I'm using materials very, very different from the way they were intended. And in doing such, you've got to have patience. I've had a couple of days where I have some uninterrupted time to play around with this, and I want to bring you an update on where I'm at with the RA4 reversal process. So just as a quick rundown, RA4, it's a color negative paper, but I'm taking it and doing some stuff that some other crazy guys have tried on and off for the last few decades. And now it seems in this world of YouTube where the information is out there and we can see experiments almost in real time from folks that folks are getting closer to a really cool reproducible process. I first was turned on to this process years and years ago looking on APUG, which is now Fotrio.com, and there's some archived photo.net posts, and a lot of guys had played around with it, but never gotten really serious. I had some renewed interest when I watched some videos from Joe Van Cleve and Ethan Moses of Camerodactyl working on the process about this time last year, and it was really cool, and I was like, I, I want to try this. The look of it was so neat, and just the idea that this really inexpensive material could be used in such a way. So if you haven't seen it yet, I'm going to drop a link to my season one video on RA4 color reversal process. This was some of my early experiments and explaining the process. But if you haven't seen it, the recap goes something like this. We're loading RA4 paper, which is color negative paper, into our camera for a direct positive exposure. This presents some color issues because this is a paper that's meant to see a negative, but it's also a tungsten balanced film. So we have double tungsten balanced issues. Remember, film base has that orange tint to it, and that's going to correct that base for printing, but usually the printing light source is also a little bit warmer. So I have to kind of double correct. I can't just throw on uh, a CTO and hope for the best. That might be a good starting point, but the color is a long ways off from there. I'd given up hope on having free time to play with this process until a few weeks ago, I went back out and I was like, you know what, I don't care what the color looks like, I just wanna get something neat. And I shot a pretty cool portrait of Lauren out in the backyard, and while the color was still that really crazy blue violet, it looks like really expired Polaroid, I already kinda liked the look, but I knew I could do a little bit better. So I started playing around earlier this week and I ended up with a, a uh, kind of neat headshot, still very blue. And then I was like, you know what? No, it's time. Let's get a proper filter pack in here and start going through the motions because that's really where the work's gonna happen. I am a hands-on learner. Not only am I a visual learner, if you tell me not to do something, I'm probably still going to do it. And then once I mess it up myself, then okay, yeah, let's, let's do this. So I have finally hit that point with RA4. I broke down and bought a pack of these Cibachrome filters, which are magenta, yellow, and cyan, and those will help me correct my filter pack. Now, normally you only have to use a little bit of this, usually some magenta and some yellow, uh, just a small bit to correct for your negative and different daylight balances. But this stuff, I'm glad I had the whole filter pack because I'm gonna need a lot of them to get the color going. So it's not gonna be full on experimentation. I've done a little bit of the heavy lifting already. I've played around with my lighting setup a bit and I've already gotten in the ballpark when it comes to filters. I've got a print that's got more skin tone but is pretty magenta. 
I've got one that's got a little more skin tone and has a bit of yellow, but is lacking some magenta. And then I have another one here that has a nicer exposure, but is lacking, I think, both in uh, quite a bit of magenta and maybe a little bit of yellow. So this back and forth process is definitely not for everyone. It helps if you have a studio space that is adjacent to your darkroom space. Otherwise, you got to set it up, shoot, pack it up, schlep on over to the dark room and then process. That's kind of the case for me. So any amount of free time is good to get this going. On the back of every one of my test sheets, I've been using some notes to tell me what type of filtration I need to make things happen. And I've just kind of been narrowing the field. I started with the filter pack that I knew that worked for the, for the really blue shots, but those were still way too blue. I needed to correct even further. So with the notes I've got here, we're going to take a look at the filter pack, take a look at what's gonna to need to be done, and then we're gonna take some shots, we're gonna to go to the dark room, and you're gonna see what those results look like live with me. Okay, so starting with the two prints that are closest in the ballpark for me right now, which are number seven, that's why I'm making the fist and the two fingers here, number seven and number five. My notes for each of those are as follows. The one that looks a little too magenta has 100 points of magenta and 130 yellow. And the one that's looking a little lacking in magenta is 90 magenta and 140 yellow. Well, seems like a pretty easy job, but we're gonna go ahead and meet her in the middle. So we're gonna need our UV blocking filter from the filter pack. We're gonna need 95 points of magenta and 130 points of yellow. So let's count them out. Gonna grab my filter pack, I've got 30 magenta, 70 magenta, 90 magenta, now I need to find a 5, and a 5 magenta. So I have 95 points of magenta, stack all that up, and 135 points of yellow. That's a lot of yellow, I found this stuff just tends to need a bit more. Oh, there's my UV filter. It barely does anything, but it does have a pretty noticeable impact, especially with these lights, which tend to have a little bit of UV. So I've got 50 yellow, another 40, that's 90, another 30, that's 120, 10, which is 130, and now I need a five, which is 135. So now I have to stack all of these filters together uh, if I have too much schmutz on one, I'm gonna clean those off. I'm gonna take my filter pack now and place these behind my Cinar Auto Aperture shutter where it can clip in and stay in place. All right, let's go ahead and get a shot loaded up. So I've got my lens closed, my filter pack inserted. Flashes are already preset. Um, I'm making it pretty easy here. My flashes are at full power all the freaking way. Dark slide out. Okay, we're gonna get head over to our first shot here. So I've got my lights set up in a way that they're relatively close so I can get the most intensity possible out of them. The reason there's a lot of lights is this is a photographic paper that's meant for the dark room and I'm, you already saw that very thick amount of filtration I'm going through. So I'm losing a ton of light to that. And I'm also relatively close up with the camera, which is suffering a lot of bellows extension factor. So there's a lot of compounding things here which can seem overwhelming, but if we piece it out and we control each individual element scientifically, just alter one thing at a time when possible, that's gonna give us our highest chance for success. So having something like a studio camera, which is rigid and just stays there, is a really key factor to this. I wouldn't do this with my field camera, which has a chance of moving around, and I wouldn't recommend this out in the field while you're testing, just because things can change. Environments are gonna shift around, your light's gonna change. Here, everything is very rigidly controlled, and well, you're about to see it. We're using a whole lot of light. I've got a little X marks the spot to measure my very narrow depth of field. I haven't hit it all the time, but hopefully this time we can get it. So we're gonna go ahead and pose this one. Ready, one and. Oh, whew, that's a lot of light. Um, I, I think that's the direction of the camera. Um, I really can't see too much of it right now. Uh, you're gonna have a lot uh, burned into your retinas uh, with this. So uh, probably don't wanna use kids or pets <laughs> for this type of photography. They will not like you very much. 
I'm gonna go ahead and make a second shot here just because I kinda like where the setup's at and I'm feeling really good about this exposure. So uh, we're back to our X marks the spot right here. The way I've got everything set up with the camera right now, this is a little bit high of the camera. Right about here should be uh, square on the paper. So I'm gonna try this one more time. I'm gonna look at this light, my key light, and I've got this little kicker light right here. This isn't filling in my face. Uh, but then this big guy up here is kind of filling things in. So I'm going to move here and I'm looking there, but also eyes on the lens. Ready? One and. Ooh, that's some lights. There you go. Do, yeah, do that squint that you did the last time. There you go. More squint. Okay, uh, now that I've kind of got vision back, I'm gonna pack the uh, shots that I just did up. We're gonna head to the dark room and we're gonna see what the results look like. All right, so we're here at 400 West Rich and I've already got my trays laid out. I'm gonna go ahead and pour some chemicals for this reversal process and then we're gonna get to, uh, to processing. Because we took a paper that's looking for a negative, we have to first make a black and white negative so that we can establish a base that the reversal exposure isn't going to overdo. So the way we do that is we have a developer bath of black and white developer. After the standard RC development time, we'll stop that in our stop bath. We'll rinse off our stop bath with a water bath because the RA4 color developer is very sensitive. Even a little bit of stop bath or Blix in there could ruin everything. So we need to rinse off all of that stop bath and that's when we can turn the lights on to provide enough exposure. Once we provided exposure uh, for I would say at least 60 seconds, then we can move to our RA4 processing bath. After a couple minutes in the RA4 processing, we're gonna to jump to the Blix and that's gonna remove everything and then final rinse and we're ready to go. So it's actually not that long from start to finish, maybe 20 minutes. All right, and if we did something even halfway right, we should see a black and white negative. This one's upside down, but that's all right. The areas that are in shadow will show up as lighter on here. So you can see the film border is completely base white as are parts of my hair. And then the areas that are darker on the paper are gonna be my lighter areas. And these all look pretty nicely evenly exposed. Now, one thing I wanna make sure I do before I get going too far is I want to rinse off all of my excess stop baths. So even though it doesn't look like there's much there, that's gonna be enough to ruin my RA4 development. So just give it a change of water. And I also have to give this some time to expose to the light. If I don't give it enough time, it's not gonna, not gonna do what I want it to do. Oh yeah, this is looking pretty cool. All right, a couple minutes on the clock for the RA4 developer and we're gonna put it in. This to me, this is what kind of makes it worth it. If you've ever seen a wet plate develop, this is very, very similar. So we're gonna go from a black and white negative to a color positive. Oh, look at that. Cheesy smile and everything. I would say the color is, uh, even through that, uh, that brown stain of the developer is looking pretty good. Oh no, my focus is off a little bit. Next one. Try to vary the agitation method. This paper is really finicky. Shadows are coming in, and there's the highlights kind of falling into place. Oh my goodness, I actually have eye color. One thing I haven't been able to see with this process, my brown eyes. Oh, that is cool. Let's 
to this other one that focus looks questionable. Oh yes, definitely questionable focus. I can already see my shirt and my microphone are sharp, but my face is blurry. Oh well. If focus is my only thing, I can work on that. Now another thing I wanted to show off is Blix because Blix is your bleach and fixer. So this is going to remove not only the black and white negative image, but some of the unused color portions. So this actually will serve to lighten your print. You see how it's kind of dissolving there? Some of the gray is fading away from the print. So it does lighten up in the Blix. So for color, Lauren wasn't wearing a maroon hoodie. She was wearing a green hoodie. I've noticed that some articles of clothing, I think what's happening is the lights are giving off infrared and infrared is very detectable with this paper. So I think if we used an infrared filter, this could help uh, change that. But as far as how the color looks otherwise, I'm really, really happy with how this is coming out. It's so much closer than I have been up until this point. Hey there. In the midst of all this excitement and getting some cool, repeatable results with that RA4 reversal process, my camera died. Yeah, the one that I shoot all of my YouTube videos with. Well, the show must go on. I've hooked my Google Pixel up to the tripod. I've got a little condenser mic on there and we're powering through. So with those results giving me some encouragement, I thought, you know what? Let's take this even a step further from where we've already gone. So I took the conversion kit that I created for my Cinar and changed it from 8x10 to that large 8x20 ultra large format back. I went ahead and took two sheets of RA4 reversal and loaded them side by side into the 8x20 holders and proceeded to find some rather long subject matter. We took my dachshund Strudel, who just turned 10 this year, and I wanted to get a portrait of him using as much of that 8x20 frame as I could. The first one was really nice and in focus, but wasn't as close as I wanted it to. We got him a little bit closer, but I knew the depth of field was gonna be really, really hard to nail that focus, so I missed focus on the second one, but executed well, and I got that same really nice color. So I think this is a filter pack that I'm gonna to continue to use. So where do I go from here? Now that I have a filter pack that I like the look of, I'm going to take this and use my meter to figure out what my new filter factor is. Once I figure out how much light exactly that's taking away, I can give myself a new adjusted ISO of this paper. So before I was working with some assumptions based on an old filter pack, I need to recorrect and standardize this. This way, when I'm setting up a studio space somewhere not here in the studio, I can work and be a little bit closer in the ballpark without having to retest completely from scratch. If you have any questions about this RA4 reversal process, or you just want to share your thoughts on where I'm at so far, or if you're doing it yourself, drop me a note down below in the comments. And if you have any long form questions, you can always feel free to shoot me an email, largeformatquestions at gmail.com. Thanks again for stopping by, and we'll catch you next week for more LFF.